I had my first business at 19, and it made surfboards. I mean, where it was a real business where you paid people. And then from then, I just contracted myself out and worked mostly for, my, for myself or just had my own businesses and paid people. We actually started in 1969, where we really formed the group that did this, and it was based on reinforced plastics, which is raw materials for surfboards, sailboats, tomato carriers, chemical toilets, ambulance stops, and even the fairings that uh, Evil Knievel jumped over the Snake River on. And that's what our that's what our basis was, plus making surfboards. And then we got into skateboards. Um, Bob explained that to you with Macaulay Sports. The first part is pulling the group together and making it an industry. And that was really fun to do because it was like having a blank piece of paper and then saying, okay, we're going to have an industry and what do we need in this industry? We need, you know, we need to have magazines, we need to have teams, we need to have marketing, we need to have pro promotion. But really what we need is profit. And so when we established this thing, we established, established it on margins. And then we kind of launched uh, Road Rider, and then all of the knowledge that I gained from doing my own businesses and all the crap I did um, started paying off. And my partner, uh, Jay Sherman, the same thing. It's all started falling into place for us. We knew what we had to do, and so we just focused on having fun making skateboards. Starting the skateboard industry. I think that was like the seven of us that got together month after month after month and pounded it out really with not being very selfish with each person's business but being looking at a, a complete goal for everybody because we knew if we created the business in the world that we would be able to survive if we were good and I think that was the, the, the greatest thing. The other one is having all these people that work for me um, Mature, you know, watching guys like Jeff Kendall, Rob Roscoff, Tim Fumarna, Bob DeKnight, all of them come in here and mature and, you know, raise their families. Pretty much what the way that people are skating will determine the changes in the truck. So if you, if you follow the process of the independent truck through, you'll see that the first truck that we made was a combination of a Bennett and a Tracker. A Tracker wore better, but a ben Bennett turned better. And then as you go through, you'll see that you have to lower the truck because the tricks are getting different. Or right now we're back to raising the truck and making it turn, um, lightening the truck up, heaving the truck down. That's kind of, you know, I think we're probably a year and a half away from another change. You know, not, I, I kind of go back to earlier when we were talking about skaters um, they don't grab technology very well. So it's really hard to substitute uh, different metals t that would actually improve the weight and the strength of the truck. It doesn't grind properly, it doesn't do this properly, it doesn't do something properly. So it's hard to take it on a technological area, so you have to make these little changes, little cosmetic change here, do something there. So that's kind of how we do it. I think we're out at the beginning of a completely different um, d uh, completely different in the sense that how we're dealing to brick and mortar, how we're dealing through the internet, um, what our competition's going to be. Um, it's just going to be a whole new style of business. And, you know, ironically, guys like Pal and I have floated to the surface many times. I think in the 80s, uh, he had a better overall public image than I did, but I think I went to the bank more than he did, you know, and, and Vision was the rock and roll, and he had the color, and he didn't, he, you know, he couldn't rob the bank anymore. So I think now that it's going to be, is the guys like George and I, Deluxe, uh, a lot of the independent companies are going to have a challenge from the um, publicly held companies, and I think that's a big challenge that is really hard for us to confront in that as a private company, our responsibility is to our workers and customers. As a publicly held company, their responsibility is to their shareholders. I've always looked at skateboarding as a means of transportation first, because if, if you look at the massive amount of skateboarders are getting from point A to point B. So if you go back into our earlier marketing, you'll see that a lot of it had to do with transportation, a kid skating along a school bus, the kids looking out, stuff like that. The downhill thing is good in that it brought a lot of, of young 
kids into uh, really analyzing the technology of a skateboard. And I don't know if there's going to, what's going to come out of that at the other end, because usually you can, you can hold on to 10 or 15% of the customers. The popsicle stick thing amazes me in that the, the radicalness and the damage of the tricks, and I think that scared a lot of kids away because they didn't want to fall, they didn't want to you know, take a rail up the crotch, they didn't want to do all this stuff, and I mean, it is radical. And so I think now that it's kind of, uh, all the videos the last two or three years have been more like having fun, cruising down hills, doing this stuff. So it's kind of melting in and hopefully we can come up with a, uh, a group of consumers that it's not gonna be a bummer to have a downhill guy in a skateboard magazine or a vertical guy in this magazine where you're treating it all kind of the same. It, it, the penny thing is, I mean, they, were, they sucked when they first came out in the 70s, and they suck now. But it's one of those things where you've got to be first through the door. You, you can't be second, and a lot of people were second. And I think Penny did a good job of doing it, as Sector 9 did with longboards. It's starting to, you know, you're, uh, if you look at, well, I have great nephews that are from 15 down to, and their friends down to four years old. So you watch what they do because they're surfers and skaters. They, they're, they're not on a surfboard or a bicycle or a skateboard. It's mostly a skateboard. They use their skateboard for transportation. And each one of them has a quiver of skateboards. They have a popsicle stick. They have what to them is a cruiser, which is about 32 inches by eight and a half. They have soft wheels. They have hard wheels. I mean, each one has three or four skateboards, and each skateboard serves a different purpose. When I started surfing in Santa Cruz, it was 1951, and Jimmy was about, he was about three years behind me in age, and he was, he, I lived in Capitola, he lived in Live Oak, and Pleasure Point was kind of in the middle. The first time I met Jimmy, there was two of us surfing Pleasure Point, and we were going out. He was coming down the stairs, and he asked us permission to surf, and I said, no, nah, you can't, you can't go surfing. You don't want any people like you out here. There's nobody in the water, and it's whole freaking, now there's like 400 people in there on the weekend. But he had a bigger friend than me, so <laughs> we negotiated a settlement. But Jimmy, when we were young, he was always the guy that did the pinstripes on our cars or did the artwork on our surfboards. And then when we started making surfboards, I think it was probably the late 50s, Jimmy was the, we worked a lot in the surf shops together. He was a glasser, a glosser, a, did a lot of pinstripe, did a lot of art. But he always on the sideline had like the Murph to Surf stuff going on and we'd always let him draw on our dashboards or our surfboards. And then in the 70s when we started in the skateboard thing, uh, Jay, my partner and him and I brought him in and he's the guy that developed the Road Rider image. He developed the Santa Cruz, first Santa Cruz logos. But it was pretty much basic. We're just putting a, a graphic on the bottom of this board. We don't need the artwork. And then we started doing the road rider deal and he started coming up with these little concept with the girl, the women, and all this other little stuff. But it was pretty much generic commercial. And then it kind of died down and then the 80s came along. Right at the end of the 70s, going into the 80s is when we started really experimenting with graphics. And then we just kind of cut them loose in the early 80s. <laughs> Go for it. And a skater would come in with an idea and he would just power it out. And that's what you get all of the art you have now. Yeah, I like the Roscoff, and the reason I like the Roscoff is the series. It was, Rob came in and we told him that if you kind of, we have this program together, you're not going to be the best, but you're going to be up there in the top ten, and we'll roll this program out and we'll, progress, we'll give you a progressive board graphics. And Rob played the thing right down to the, to the wire, and so we were able to roll those board graphics out. And I think in the 80s, if you took all those graphics together, it's probably the largest board sales of any skater because it, you, you, it, each board, no, but if you put them all together, yeah. And I like the series that Rob and Jimmy came up with. It started out with a dot and then, or a target, and then it just kind of progressed into this monster. And we figured 10 years, I figured 10 years. I told them when he started, you got 10 years. You can travel all over the place. You can screw a lot of chicks. You can have really a lot of fun. You can make some money. If you listen to me, you'll come out with some money and you'll have really a good time. And if you can fit school in there somewhere, do it. Rob was right down in his textbook. So right now we own, we own the Santa Cruz mountain bikes together. And I mean, it's just kicking ass. Um, Nottis was probably, Nottis was one of the unbelievable, he was, this guy was just unbelievable, the stuff he would pull. I mean, he'd just kind of go way before his time, 10, 15 years.